Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. We are back. We're picking up where we left off yesterday, how to have a successful, happy marriage in partnership. And this is day number five. And I have to say all the really great comments on Facebook and all the rest of it. I sincerely, and uh, you know, it's great. It's great that you guys are giving us the uh, room to expand what our content is going to be on this podcast. Not that we don't love talking about real estate stuff because we do, but it's also fun to, I think, sprinkle in a little bit more variety and uh, you, the reception that we're getting for this type of information, I have to say, is really nice. So thank you for that. And thank you for all of you who have given us a great five-star review on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify. And for those of you who haven't yet, well, then this is your homework assignment from today's podcast. Make sure you give us a five-star review. Don't wimp out and give us a four-star review. Give us a five-star review. You know you want to <laughs> over on Spotify or ideally on iTunes. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, please do uh, subscribe to the uh, channel. We sincerely appreciate it. And uh, yeah, Julie, so we're picking up where we left off uh, yesterday, and this is part five of six. We're going to be ending on Valentine's Day and how to have a successful, happy marriage and partnership. Uh, so, Julie, did you get any direct contacts from folks uh, with regard yes, to... Yes, a lot of... Well, this originated... the. the we wanted to do this for a while, but the original idea was indeed a special request from three mm -hmm. or four specific people. And I I think you would agree, over the years, we've had many requests to cover this on different levels. Why and have we done this before, honestly? I think we kind of felt like it was uh, maybe a little bit out of the wheelhouse because we usually have very pointed, very specific dollar productive you know, business points. But I think this is really important. I'm glad we're doing it. But have you thought about other than that, though? What you just said, obviously, I agree with. But do you have any other reasons why we wouldn't have been talking more about these types of semi-personal topics? Because people really like it. I think that maybe we had a reticence because people are so easy to trigger with certain words that mm -hmm. wouldn't have. I you you and I were joking yesterday about, you know, back in the olden tongue when you could use specific <laughs> words that had specific meanings and didn't have a hundred ways to read into what you might have possibly intended, which you didn't intend. Yeah, we were joking around. We we're referring to the way people talked, say, five years ago as old English yes. versus this new English, yeah. which you need a special decoder ring to understand half the time. Exactly. And it is really kind of shocking how people sometimes will take things out it's really the out of context stuff which you exactly which is really kind of scary is how mm -hmm. people just read one little blurb and spin it off in some other direction but really our quest here is to help you guys that's really i think that's what it. most of you um most of you understand that's our mission we're just trying to make your lives better and by making your lives better we're going to you know improve that's our little contribution to society frankly because if we can help in individuals, if we can help you make your, in this case, your relationships better, um, then you'll make your uh, business better. Because it's an interesting way it feeds it, the uh, reverse um, benefit is that if you're happy at home, if you're more motivated, uh, you know, we talked about this the other day, right? Every man and woman needs th need effectively three things to have um, a sense of well-being. They need someone to love, and you can expand on that, obviously. They need a sense of purpose or a meaningful job or something to you know do for with their living, uh, and they need something to look forward to. And if you have those three things, generally speaking, you're going to have your head uh, fairly well screwed on. And um, yeah, so if we can bring some resemblance of normality to your lives, sanity, uh, to sanity, <laughs> then I think we've accomplished our goal. And again, this topic is something that's going to open the door for Julie and I talking about more things. We are going to be expanding the podcast probably starting next month and adding more shows, actually. Uh, so we'll have more than five per week. We're probably going to do some interview shows. So many people want us to interview them on the podcast, but also inviting us to be on their podcast, all the rest of it. We've kind of resisted some of that um, for a whole variety of reasons. But uh, yeah, we're going to start doing more interviews. And the rules, I'm going to have actually anyone that we interview on this podcast they're going to have to agree ahead of time that there's no taboos, no no topics that are going to be um, off limits. Because a lot of times you'll get somebody on and they'll have a, you know three or four points. And we did interviews in the past, and they show up with an agenda. And the agenda is you know once they're off those four or five points or whatever it is, 
they can't talk about anything. <laughs> so they're going to have to not only be ab able to express themselves and talk about a wide variety of topics, but they're also going to have to be able to defend whatever it is that they say. And I'll give you, for example, there was a guy, I'm trying to remember, this was a tech platform. Mm -hmm. This was probably seven, eight, maybe even 10 years ago. Okay. And we had him on the podcast. Oh, I do remember now. And I won't mm -hmm. mention his name because he got in trouble after he said this. But he was some founder of some big tech company. It was a CRM. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually, this is back, it was a webinar. It wasn't even a podcast. And I'm remembering all this. Mm -hmm. So he actually said that there had been a, bu a bunch of studies that had been done. And remember, this guy sold CRMs for a living. That a, a base, a, I'm trying to use his words, it invalidated the concept of long-term lead follow-up. And this information had been done by, um, I think it was Harvard or Yale or some, you know, Harvard business Not a real estate something. entity. No, not a real estate entity. No one had a dog in the fight, basically. It was uh, some uh, study that was done at a very academic level trying to prove whether the long-term lead follow-up, and I'm, I'm talking about drip campaigns, are even worth doing. And remember, this dude sold a CRM for a living. And the whole concept behind CRMs is yes to organize your data, but the way it's sold to agents is that it's going to be, you know, you're going to create these long-term lead follow-up campaigns and those long-term lead follow-ups campaigns are going to act as your silent salesperson. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to have to actually learn how to, you know, yeah. have conversations with folks because you're going to digitally, you know, drip on them. Nurture your database. Exactly. You guys yeah. have heard all this before. Mm -hmm. Well, we knew that that was not true. Um, and we had read similar studies, but the reason that we knew it wasn't true is because all the tens of thousands of coaching co uh, clients we had over the years who had all validated that it wasn't true. And it was he, so he shows up to this interview and he starts talking about the fact that long term lead follow up is absolutely a waste of time. And um, he was saying this and it was so powerful because he actually cited the research. I really should un uh, unbury this and find out what he said. Afterwards, he just catches a mountain of shit, not from agents, but from investors, because he told the truth. And he begged for us to take the interview mm -hmm. down. And yeah. we did. And we did because we didn't want to have the guy get you know financially hurt. Yep. But we did I take it down. That. But so those are the types of situations that um, if you're going to be on this podcast and you're going to be interviewed, you better be ready to defend whatever it is that you're saying is true. So if, if you're going to be on here and you're going to start telling us that you get all your business from social – we know that's not true, and so we're going to unbury that. We're going to you know, reverse engineer whatever it is you say, and you better be willing and able to actually defend it with numbers. Um, so that'll mean ultimately we won't have a lot of people requesting to be interviewed. <laughs> well, the thing <laughs> which is, which leads us it, back to not doing interviews. Exactly. I'm sure that we'll do some. I know you've got a list that you're working on. Well, coaching clients are great. You Absolutely. Know, we love interviewing well, success stories. actual practitioners. Of course. It's, it's where we get into the troubles when we start uh, uh, interviewing vendors. Right. People selling you guys stuff. Yeah. Those because those yeah. people really oftentimes they know what they're selling is mostly a farce. It is, but you know, it's a different relationship than what we have with our listeners. Yep. Because they don't really have any accountability whether it works for you or not. There are many people standing in line right where you came from getting licensed this very moment, yep. which will be the next people they sell something to. So it is a totally different relationship, but I think that there's probably some valid ones, some that, that will be valuable to them to hear. But it's funny what you, the picture you painted about interviews are not always just like these five questions I'm going to ask you this and you're going to answer that you you like to do I think they call it a long form interview where you dive a bit deeper and you pull out the facts and you get somebody to be introspective and since neither one of you really know where that's going to end up that requires that your guests be transparent and you know willing to go down that potential rabbit hole with you I don't and you like, never know <laughs> well, the interviews that I hate the most yeah. um, mm -hmm. we are li we're listening to an interview um, <laughs> we're going to talk about some controversial stuff at least for some Morning. of you so uh, Lex what was his last name do you I remember I never remember his last name yeah a, a very you know I, th I think he's on a scale of 1 to 10 probably a 7 out of 10 as far as uh -huh. being an interviewer mm -hmm. so he's interviewing the CEO warning warning <laughs> of <laughs> Pfizer be triggered. of Pfizer yeah and he asked, the, he asked the question, and Lex is a, an engineer, he's a scientist, and he asked a very you know, pointed question about whether children of certain ages should be getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And the guy, and, and essentially the reason, and which Lex had talked about on his podcast before, and by the way, this is only maybe a month ago, and now it's essentially all, you guys noticed that the mask mandates are going away. You notice all the talk about vaccinating children is going away. You notice that in essence that- Even, even the booster talk is going even away. Even the booster talk is going away. The federal government now is saying that basically they're having to re-spin the whole conversation about whether we're in some sort of pandemic. The fact is, is the pandemic is effectively over. And now is it over for people psychologically? No. And a lot of people are going to be harmed forever. 
you know, there's a lot of studies out showing that children, because of the fact that they had to live through the pandemic, are going to have, uh, you know, potentially a, a loss of uh, their ability to read faces and communicate. And there are going to be speech impediments from little kids that never learn how to speak properly and all the rest of it. So the long tail damage as there's all this pandemic is going to be pretty severe, not to mention all the poor souls that were lost. So in any event, he and Julie and I were vaccinated. So let's make sure we're, you know, very clear yeah. on what side of this ledger we're on. He asked the Pfizer CEO about vaccinating children, and it was a question that would have been answered correctly if it was being answered honestly with numbers. Well, this is how many people this, and this is how many people that, and this is the- Stats and facts. Okay, well, the fact is, and the facts are, that children don't get sick from Omicron. It's very, very rare that anyone even died of COVID that didn't have multiple comorbidities. We have learned all that in the last, uh, you know, almost Mm -hmm. two and a half years. So the guy from the Pfizer answered the question not in a, I would say, uh, honest way. He started telling a story about how I have to, you know, so Lex asks the question, the guy answers, I have to deal with parents every day asking me, when am I going to get my children vaccinated? I'm vaccinated. My dog is vaccinated. Well, by the way, they were starting to come out with vaccinations for dogs. I'm not making that up. And so uh, then, you know, I need to, we need to be providing vaccinations for kids because their parents are so scared to leave the house. And so he was answering the question, trying to manipulate um, Lex and frankly, all the listeners. He was giving a social answer to a medical question. Exactly. And that is a dishonest way of answering what was an honest question. And those are the types of things that even if you don't catch it, like Julie and I were really listening but even if you don't catch it, you intuitively know that someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Well, so when with Julie and I do interviews, um, we don't want to let that happen uh, because oftentimes that will happen because the person is trying to bond with you or trying to be friends with you. Or there's an emotional thing that they're trying to, you know. There's some other issue going on. Exactly. Yeah. And we, so if you want to be on our podcast, we start doing interviews. All I'm saying is you better eat your Wheaties. And that's a reference that no (laughs) one over probably 35 will understand. Uh, Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Well, that brings us to our next point. Yes. (laughs) So in a roundabout way, but still back to the next point. And again, the topic is how to have a successful, happy marriage and partnership. So point number 12, Julie. Yes. Point number 12, follow a, I put the word mainstream media free existence because, you know, you can curate podcasts and listen to good podcasts, but generally you want to have a media-free existence as much as possible. Choose podcasts that you both enjoy, which expand your thinking and knowledge base. History and science are good categories to start with. There's so many great podcasts. Some of them are like 12 to 20 minutes long, and you just pick up some kind of little tidbit. I I got some uh, about houses I was telling you about in Philadelphia. You know, the original uh, old, old houses there have caves for basements, which were made by the original settlers there. And that's That's something, I mean... I have studied it, and so have you history forever and housing stuff forever, and I had never known that. So just little interesting things that add a little bit more color to your day, that add to your knowledge base. Doesn't have to be political, doesn't have to be, you know, some kind of agenda, but there's so many great educational things out there, Um, podcast-wise. So a nerdy housing fact. Yes. The oldest standing brick house Mm -hmm. in North America Mm -hmm. was built by one of my direct bloodline relatives. Yes. Francis Tufts. Who came over on, I think, ship number four or something yeah, right after the four. Mayflower. Right, exactly. Yeah. So the, on my mom's side, we're Tufts. And those of you guys who are in Massachusetts, you know, of Tufts University. Mm-hmm. Yes, I stem from that uh, bloodline. And no, I wasn't because he was like a great, great, great uncle. And my brother and I both tried to get scholarships to Tufts. And they said, no, because you're uh, the you know, great, great, great. Exactly, yeah. not direct. But yes, that is our family and the oldest standing brick house in North America. You guys can Google it. It was built by one of my relatives, which yes. is pretty awesome. But the point is, you know, don't tune into stuff that's going to mess with your mindset because that can also creep into your relationships, your marriage, your partnership. You want to curate what you're putting into your head. And that's part of your environment that we talked about yesterday. So like we were listening, you and I listened to uh, – what was the one that I just tuned you into? The Carlin, George Carlin, or no, not George Carlin. The uh, Hardcore History. Hardcore one. History. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That one's really good. That's a again a long that guy really long, really deep dive into yeah. particular so, topics, but also very interesting. It is interesting. So when you start sharing those experiences, and again, we try to stay inside our wheelhouse uh, about real estate and being a business owner, you know, all the things, right? But we also intentionally try to meander outside and look for things that we're not overly familiar with. Because what happens is when you're listening, for example, to something on history, and this is this happens all the time, it will shock you how frequently you discover your understanding of something that happened historically 
is incorrect or was mm-hmm. biased but one way or the other. Um, well, frankly, you didn't even know about it. That's where I am embarrassed to admit. Well, there, there's actually a podcast called uh, Stuff You Think You Know. Yeah. And it, it just basically throws that under the bus and says, well, here's what's actually true. Yes, because over time, when some, you know, the, the well, old saying. People is, study stuff. The victors, <laughs> victors write the history. Yeah. But also over time, when someone's deciding, okay, well, we're going to teach these kids what history is, mm-hmm. there's going to be some omissions. Otherwise, these books are going to be massive, right? And so some of those omissions of, the, of what actually happened are the most interesting parts of the whole entire story. Mm-hmm. And when you see the uh, contextual differences, it changes your perspective. Now, how does that translate back to your business and personal life? Because those same contextual differences uh, that all of a sudden reframe something that you thought just was – will then have an, a side stream benefit of you then allowing yourself to reframe what you believe is true about your current reality or in the mm-hmm. case of the keeping with the theme here about your marriage or your relationship or how you interact with the rest of society. Like, uh, for example, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people, it's the old thing is history, um, you know, in essence repeats itself. Mm-hmm. And it does in some varies, uh, variations because sure. what happens is that like, so we're all not, we went through a pandemic mm-hmm. and now we're going to go through some big inflationary bout. A few years ago, there was basically a housing crash, which yeah. probably really realistically will be remembered as a depression. All these different things. Sure. But how many generations does it take for people to forget the lessons that they were supposed to have learned? Well, I'll tell you, not damn very many or not very damn many. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because what happens is all of these things that we're experiencing now, if you study history, we've gone through before. Civilization has dealt with before. There have been pandemics before. There have been, you know, depressions before. There have been all kinds of these things before. So if you want to have a good forecast of what's going to happen next, look to see what happened after those things happened, you know, 300 years well, ago. Well, that's why they're saying due to our uh, historic inflation, historically, there's been a recession afterwards. And yep. they can chart that. That's not speculation. That is historical fact. I heard a report today that uh, the cost of used cars, the cost of new cars are up like 6 to 12% depending on brand, but the cost of used cars are now up 45%. Well, so it's here's, amazing. Here's one. So this is with people using their limit. You think the history, like all of us have this bias, right? Especially young people. And I was a young person once too. And I had this <laughs> You're bias You're old enough well. to remember. I, every, you think, you limit your, um, your, I would say, your perspective, unfortunately, to what your own life experience has been, mm-hmm. and you overly, overly rely on what you were told, and you don't go outside of your own wheelhouse to do your own homework to validate or invalidate some of the things that you believe are true. Uh, and then, then what happens is basically that momentum of those uh, sort of dysfunctional thoughts carry forward to the rest of your life, and you never reach your full potential. These are the things, unfortunately, that happen. But I'll give you one that was re- recently spun because you guys can all then relate. So inflation. Now, mm-hmm. Julie and I have never lived through inflation. The last bit of real substantial inflation happened when we were little kids. Many of you, half of you at least, weren't even born, right? It was Jimmy Carter and it was Paul Volcker and interest rates went to double digits. And, you know, we heard these folklore stories being told. Gas to prices, all and gas lines. Exactly. So we had some memories of that, but not really any. We are, our memories came from our parents. But when here's what we do know, and this has happened in history many times before when there has been a essentially a fiat currency. I don't want to get too ahead of my skis here because I'm not an economist, but in essence, when a fiat currency has been um, flooded in the market, overproduced, when governments have the next thing that happens is when there's too much debt, uh, governments will print more dollars and in essence pay off their debts with inflated dollars. That's in essence what we're experiencing now. So it's very predictable. But what was happening was when this inflation started, what was the spin? It is temporary inflation. It's going to work itself out. Well, if you'd done a little bit of homework, you'd realize that most inflationary bouts like what we're experiencing now last 10 years. So if you believed that there, and here's the other thing I saw happening. This especially wasn't happening in real estate. And I see people that are still making this. I had this conversation yesterday with someone. I'm going to wait buying a house because Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a housing crash. Well, why? Well, it's because there was before. And whatever goes up must go down again. Based on what? You know, I asked this person, mm-hmm. well, based on the fact, you know, what I'm talking about mm-hmm. based on the fact that this is the cycle that it did before. Well, can you show me historically where there's been an inflationary double digit is where it really is a uh, time like this where the real estate has deflated at the end of the inflation? Can you show me an example of that going back? And it doesn't even have to be U.S. history. And the answer there is not one, because what happens is once this inflation settles in. 
obviously there's a lot of shock and awe initially, and that's what we're experiencing. But after it settles in and everyone's sort of normal and wages finally catch up and everyone sort of gets used to paying these higher prices, there's a really fun study. You guys should research this yourselves. Uh, the Campbell soup, uh, cost of a can of Campbell's soup. And what you'll see, and again, Google this yourself because it is fascinating. So they've been making Campbell's soup, you know, forever, right? It's exactly, basically the same product. And you can chart on these. Uh, and so they show the cost of uh, Campbell's soup all the way back in like the 20s. And then it shows that the price, the actual price that you paid was, I'm going to make up the numbers, I don't remember. It was like a nickel, right? It was always the same. It was the same for generations. If you're, you are paying the same amount for, for a can of Campbell's soup that your grandma did back when she was your age. You guys getting the point? But then all of a sudden, something weird starts to happen in the 70s. Then all of a sudden, that Campbell's soup now starts to skyrocket in price. Well, what the hell happened? Why did that happen? Why was it we are essentially what we saw is for a long periods of time, there really was no inflation. Now people say, well, it's normal for there to be two to three percent inflation per year, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, research the history of things before you just parrot back something you heard without validating or invalidating the, the source of the information, because then what you'll discover is what I'm saying is true. And so where the inflation really start when we went off the gold standard. Again, I'm not going to start boring you guys with all this. But I will leave this if you're really wanting to be a nerd. This is a book that Julie and I really enjoyed a few years ago. Um, it was called A New Case for Gold. And don't be, uh, don't go off into any tangents in your mind because of the title. Some of you are going to all of a sudden start you know, manifesting things because of the word gold. Because, again, you've been triggered in some way. Just read the book. It's written by uh, uh, Rickards, Rikards? I think it's Jim. Jim Rickards, yeah, something like that. Yeah. But it's called A New Case for Gold. The fascinating part of it, in which Julie and I both enjoyed uh, listening to, was how the actual Federal Reserve came into formation when it happened after World War II. Again, the history of it all. And when you learn the history of how the actual monetary system in the United States, and really, as a result, the entire globe, was formed, I promise you that it'll reformat the way you look at money. It's so Definitely. interesting. But that goes to the point of update your thinking all the time. Yep. Is what you believe because you heard it on some kind of news entertainment show and it was speculative and it's trying to make you think a certain way or is it actually historically accurate as learned by somebody who professionally studies that or is an actual economist? And I'll say- There's such a massive difference between those two things. Since we're talking about media- Even though they're all media. Pay attention, like be introspective and be observant. Anytime somebody or something, especially an institution, is telling you to uh, not uh, check your check their sources, in other words, just blindly believe what I'm saying, you know that they're trying to get you to believe something that's probably not true. Or my favorite, where it doesn't actually say, it'll just say, uh, sources we contacted indicated. Right. And they don't actually give you even a breadcrumb to go on. The stronger someone tries to get you to not listen to opposing views or opinions, the more you have to realize that they are fearful that you're going to discover whatever it is that they're trying to sell to you or tell you or get you to believe it probably is uh, not in your best interest. So be introspective and be observant of how aggressive certain entities are trying to get you to believe something. And then you have to say, hmm. This person really must have a lot invested in me having that perspective. And I'll add to this. When you see the levers that they're trying to pull and the dials they're trying to spin are emotional, when they're trying to manipulate you through your feelings, you know that they're lying because they don't have any ground to stand on. Otherwise, they would be saying they'd be using numbers and facts, yeah. not trying to manipulate you through your emotions. But this That's goes right. back to the point number 12. You know, be media free because even you can have the you can have the highest IQ, the most intellectual curiosity ever. You can completely and totally uh, done your best to fend off any kind of I think uh, insurgent um, you know I think uh, malfeasance in your mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, but what will ultimately happen is some of that shit's going to sneak in, and so you have to. The best thing for you to do is purge your life from mainstream media. Purge your life from commercialized media because at the end of the day, all they're trying to do is get you to be triggered to react to certain things so they can sell you advertising. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a hell of a lot of information that's going to start pouring out about how honestly evil some of this stuff has gotten. And I'm talking about Google. I'm talking about all these other different widgets, you know, that's been uh, created 
to to manipulate your habits. Not provide information, yeah. but to provide specific information that has an agenda with you believing it. Well, we were listening to a very interesting podcast about that, and that might make for a good show for us to share some facts. We'll have to pull that out and make sure that we're, you know, fact-checking ourselves. You know, we'll probably be on the right target when we start getting, uh, you know, deplatformed. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I but know. I don't think you Isn't and I, we don't have the guts for that. I know. Real no. estate is much too plain vanilla for us. Exactly. We, yeah. I know. Okay. So, well, and I do think that uh, one of the results of the pandemic is that we have all seen that we have to be accountable for our own education and our own research. Well, you said yesterday, Jules, when you said there's a record number of people getting uh, LLCs. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of people. That is the subconscious, the unconscious, subconscious, what the hell is it? Unconscious, conscious, and whatever it is. Yes. Well, they're taking control of their own destiny. Well, what's the Carl Jung, uh, he said that there's the conscious and then there's the unconscious, the the collective 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 unconscious. unconscious, Right. That's a Jungian. (laughs) Yes, uh, collective unconscious. Well, so you can see based on behaviors that there's a lot of people people out there that are beginning to wake up to the realization that they have to be more in control of their own destinies. And boom, you have a massive influx of new people forming uh, businesses. And boom, you have a massive influx of people getting into real estate and wanting to get into real estate. If that doesn't tell you the direction where our country is going to go, nothing will. You're just ignoring it. Well, that's the bubbling of independence, isn't it? Exactly. That's Americans getting back to being what we all really are, which is a rugged individualist. As much as as much as the uh, you know collective forces have tried to force us to be uh, collectivists, we yes. are not. No, we are not. You know, this, there's no utopian f- a future. We're all going to be sharing. Okay, let's talk about a little history <laughs> lesson since we're on a tangent. Julie, we have time. We need to watch her. Yeah, yeah I know. We, so okay. you were yes. telling me a story mm-hmm. that you learned from listening to something, which I did not know, mm-hmm. that about the original settlers yes. or uh, the original um, whatever you want to call them mm-hmm. uh, into the United States yep. were actually basically socialist forward slash communists. Yes. Well, so, and it didn't work out for them. Right. Tell the story from well, a historical perspective. So, again, this is something I've listened to a little while ago. So, you know, grain of salt. Uh, first fact is that Jamestown was not the only – um, settlement. There were many little, you know, attempts at being a Jamestown, and and most of them either uh, got sick on the way over, or they got, got smallpox or something, or they were killed by Indians or what have you. So there were many, many different settlements. One of which, and I don't think it was Jamestown. It was uh, right around that time, though. Uh, there were settlers, you know, men and women and children, and they decided, well, we're going to try something different here. We're going to be more communal. And I'm going to grow all the corn and you're going to grow the, you know, chickens and somebody else will grow the grain and we'll just all share it. Right. Well, that lasted for like a month and a half. And then they started killing each other over this because I wasn't getting enough. And how do you know how much is to share? And maybe you're hoarding what you grow, but I already shared with you what I grow. And it it just was unsustainable. And that um, colony didn't make it. So why is the failing of essentially what was an attempt at socialism on U.S. shores? It sounded okay in the beginning. Why was it purged from the history books? Because I didn't know this until Julie told me. Did you guys know this? So this is what I'm saying. You got to check your facts, check your resources, and enjoy with your spouse or your partner or going back and having these as sort of, I would say, intellectual conversations. But more than anything, it's a break from the normal pattern of behavior. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it causes you then to venture off into thinking about new things because you're expanding your thinking. You're expanding. We well, are upgrading your own brain. Exactly. Really. You know, and I, as I listen to a lot of that stuff, I remind myself that, you know, when we were in school and when all of your kids are in school and you're learning about, say, you know, the, the founding of the country, those teachers only have, what, like three chapters on that because now they've got to go teach you something else. And so the prevailing stories keep on going, right? So we, right. that's why we all know about Jamestown is because they had 20 minutes to teach you about that on a Monday when you were in first grade, right? But there are there's so much more vastness to all of these stories and the facts and, and historical truths out there. So if you're looking to you know, fill your brain with something that's interesting, that's non-political and non-opinionated. I, that's why one of my go-tos is indeed history. Yeah. And so, guys, so we've belabored that point. I and think. it also af- affects your housing brain. I mean, it, it broadens totally. your perspective so much. So point number 13, look forward more than you look back. When you believe that the best is yet to come, you will make it so. If you believe you've already lived the best of your life, you're already giving up. So look forward more than you look back. And again, this goes back to environment. If everyone around you, um, I, Julie always rolls her eyes when I use this as an example, but it's really, the, if you can think of a better way for me to express this and please well, do it, it. Okay. 
Um, but, you know, we're from Ohio, and I promise you when you're 50 and you're in Ohio, chances are your experience on planet Earth is not the same as if, say, you're 50 and you're in Southern California. Depending on your environment, you have a completely different approach um, and perspective to what you expect from life. And it is very fascinating. Now, some of you guys are going to say, and you're going to be right, that it's the outdoor environment in Southern California, for example. You can go out and do a lot more exercising and whatnot. It does help. It does, absolutely. Yeah. But really what it drills down on is the willingness to be exposed to things that are different than your immediate environment and your willingness to actually you know, take action once you're exposed to those things. And we don't need to really, I think, talk about that much more than that. But really the, the responsibility that you have – to yourself, to your spouse, to your partner, is to make sure you're not um, essentially rooted so deeply into your particular environment that you've become, um, you know, old too soon. Or stuck. Or yes. poor or anything because of the fact that everyone around you and your environment is the same way. And it is very, very, very easy. Matter of fact, I would say it's natural to fall into that trap. It's, well, look, Social Security Administration, I don't know if this is how current this is, but the essence of it was is everyone is born and dies within, I think it was the same 25 mile radius. It might be 50 mile radius. And um, you don't, so that- And there, uh, the second fact to that was, and they are also either dependent on the government financially or on their own kids financially by right. the time they get you know grown up. Right, so it, exactly. So over 90% of everyone, once they reach the age of retirement, whatever that is, yeah. are either dependent on the government or a family member or both just to basically survive. So people have their entire lives to basically create some financial independence for themselves, but they don't. So you got to look again, why is that? It's because we're following these tribal behavioral patterns that are really not needed anymore, especially if you are going to, uh, you know, frankly, seize on all these technological revolution, uh, evolutionary things that are happening or revolutionary things that are happening. Yes. Yeah, so look forward more than you look back. One of the best ways you can do that is to actually set real goals so if you don't have your treasure map done yet, that's the way to get there. That helps you to look forward more than you look back. What are you looking forward to on a yearly basis, on a quarterly basis? We don't really teach a five-year outlook because I think so many things are so different over that span of time. We have a 90-day massive action plan. We've got the, the treasure map. So you've got to be looking forward more than you're looking back. You know what? I just thought of something. Why what? aren't we? Whatever happened to that alien story that was starting to bubble up last year? <laughs> yeah, that has kind of dried up. We'll it has. To, I know. We have need to more, follow some more breadcrumbs. It, it's it. almost like there was all these government releases about aliens. Well, because they snuck that in on us. Yeah. You well, know. distracting us from uh, something. Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. Well, yeah, but anyway, now we sound a like future show. No, there <laughs> no Google aliens. We're not conspiracy <laughs> theorists. They're like, okay, I'm out. Though now. when we did go on our road trip last year, we did go to Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, and by the way, the navigation. Was was scrambled all around that area. It was true. Yep. Yeah. It was scrambled. Mm -hmm. and, but go to um, Instagram and you can see some of our Fruit Loop pictures from our big trip <laughs> last year. Exactly. But we did drive all the way out to the middle of nowhere to go to Roswell and saw the whole, it was awesome. the whole shebang um, about <laughs> all the alien Mickey Mouse. But in any event, yeah, but here's the real thing, the real reason. If you are believing, again, this goes back to being media free, that your tomorrow is not going to be better than your today. If you believe that, because, again, you'll reinforce it with the inputs from all your different media sources and even people, then what, what, has, what effect does that have on your today? A, you're not going to take care of your health. B, you're not going to take care of your relationship. C, you're not going to take care of your finances. And the list goes on and on. And what does that result in? You are indeed instilling or I think solidifying the fact that your future will suck compared to your mm -hmm. present reality. Well, here is a fact. Every single human in, well, at least in the United States, um, even the poorest of the poor, their life is in their existence on this in on this planet in this country primarily is so much better than it was even 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. For sure, the poorest people in the United States now um, live like uh, essentially have many. There's many aspects and qualities of their lives that are better than the kings and queens from you know generations ago. Yeah. How about indoor plumbing, air conditioning? You know, the list goes on. <laughs> how about medical care? Medical care. You know. Yeah. How about education? How about the internet? Well, you know that uh, back then you mentioned medieval times. The barber was also the doctor. Oh, I brother. suppose because he had the equipment to cut his people. I don't know. I think that's the way it works here in Puerto Rico, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. We shouldn't mention that. Yeah, we shouldn't. Okay, so but, point number 14. Well, but that yeah. again, belaboring that point, though, mm -hmm. there's the fact is, 
is that even though maybe people want you to believe and maybe you're feeding your mind with these beliefs that things are getting worse, there is no aspect of life that's getting worse. No. Everything is getting better. Again, do your own research. Do your own research. Why is it you're allowing yourself to be propagandized into believing that things are not getting better? What is the agenda of the people that are trying to get you to believe that? What is your motivation for wanting to believe that? And from a coaching perspective, here's what it roots back to. And we've seen this happen billions of times, billions and billions, billions Carl Sagan. Yes, uh, of times, is the reality is, is that if you believe that tomorrow is not going to be better than today, you are giving yourself an out to not have to do mm-hmm. what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. If you think you're too old, if you're too fat, too dumb, too this, the other thing. How about this? You think the housing market's going to crash, so you're not doing anything today. How many of you are just you know trying to feast on any information with the belief that all these people making money in real estate are all of a sudden going to be on the poor line and you know all of this crap? crap that you guys are seeking out. Why are you doing it? What is the output? What is the result of you actually ingesting that type of content? Do you feel motivated? Are you doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level? No, you're doing more of, you know, you're essentially uh, drilling down and finding more information to confirm that you indeed don't have to take actions that will require a lot of effort. And guys, then you're going to absolutely positively make your tomorrow worse than your today. So you will uh, be in the anomaly Uh, that does indeed have a future that's not better than your present reality because you created it with the actions you did or didn't take today. Point number 14. 14. All right. And this is really important with regards to our topic, uh, having a happy marriage and partnership. Define and separate your own financial, household, children, religious, everything, responsibilities. Have defined roles like a corporation does. A family, a marriage, is an entity that has lots of working parts. So many, and I've seen that with us, I've seen that with coaching clients, when there is conflict, it's usually because there is disagreement on financial, household, children, you know, raising kids, uh, you know, religion, education, fill in the blank. This goes back to the first point that you wrote on the first day, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, five shows ago, where you basically gave talk about this. You gave them a list of the things that it's a long checklist. Make sure you're on the same page. If you're not on the same page with 95% of the things that Julie gave you, Mm -hmm. um, on the, first, on the first of this series, chances are those problems aren't going to go away. They're going to compound. And don't marry or choose someone to be your partner thinking that you're somehow going to convince them to change. <laughs> right. Well, and this is a slightly different spin to that. Everything that you just said is true. You've got to have the discussion rewind to the the opening show on this uh, series. But this is once that once you are on the same page or at least mostly on the same page, now you've got to decide who is responsible for what, Yep. right? So that comes down to, I mean, the thing that I see, because I do the treasure map with lots of coaching clients, is who's actually in charge of your checkbook? By who, the way. Who's in charge of your credit cards? If you guys, well, so let's, so if you guys, we mentioned the treasure map, but we yeah. keep on forgetting to tell them how to get it for yeah. free. It's my, it's my dumb fall on commercial guy. That's right. Because you, de- 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 we basically decide I'm commercial guy. On I tried podcast. to lead you in. Too. I know, I know, I know. You, <laughs> you, you okay. basically, you put the bait in the water and I was too dumb to see it. I didn't it. hook you. Yeah. So here's the bottom line is if you guys want the real estate treasure map, which is your fill in the blank business and life plan, it's very simple. Just text the word Harris to 47372. Text the word Harris, our last name, to 47372. And it is your, it is, frankly, when you guys see this thing, you're going to say, A, why are we giving it away? Uh, you could sell this. Well, we do sell it, we do. but we don't want you to buy it. We want you to take it for free. And we, we're doing that because if you do it and you complete it, you are going to have such a sense of clarity and purpose that we know for a fact that we will have you know, fulfilled our mission with at least you for having completed that. We're going to have helped you in a profound way. So do the treasure map, download it, text the word Harris to 47372. And when you do, by the way, you're going to be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. And that is the path that many of you will choose to become coaching clients. Now, if you want to skip the line and you just want to become a coaching client, you don't want to have to, you know, you don't even want to speak to anybody. You know you're ready to become a Harris coaching client. You want to join Premier Coaching. We've made that easy for you too. Just text the word Premier to 47372 and we'll text you back a link and you can go right to the page and you can become a Premier Coaching client for around $100 a month depending on which path you choose. Again, if you just want to download the real estate treasure map, go ahead and do it. That's for you. Uh, absolutely waiting for you. Text the word Harris to 47372. Um, if you're ready to join Premier and you want to skip the line, just text the word Premier to 47372. Remember, message and data rates uh, may apply. 
Yes. So back to our point about define and separate your own responsibilities, we would let us to uh, reminding you about the treasure map is the financial part of this. Many times when we're doing the, the treasure map, and there's a section called my financial picture, which is where we start before we get into the goal setting. You've got to know where you stand now before you can make any projections. Well, one of the most common things that happens is a coaching client will think that their monthly overhead is this. All the time. Based on a guesstimate, and right? They always, I mean, they have kind of a feel for but it. But isn't that shocking, though? I know. They always say the same thing. By the way, I'm going to ask you all of you guys. So collectively, there's tens of thousands <laughs> of you guys that are listening to this live and replay. So here's the question. How much is your personal monthly overhead? I know what you said, and you're wrong. It's probably twice what you just said. Yes, and why is that convoluted? It's because, and it, I have to say, it does especially happen in marriages, right? Because maybe you're the one writing checks, but I'm the one paying the credit cards. And maybe I do that fairly regularly, but I don't really have anything on auto draft. And then when an extra bill comes up, maybe we put that on a different credit card and there's no real congruence of your financial picture. So what your picture is in your head of what the monthly overhead is, is maybe a bit different than what mine is because we haven't combined forces to be real about it. And this does make them squirm. This is a, a kind of an uncomfortable thing. And they work through it. You have to work through it because you can't really be a, a you know responsible adult not knowing your finances, right? It's, you know, business maturity on one level and also personal maturity on another. But they, then after they work through it and they're uncomfortable, then there's always this sense of, okay, well, at least I know what it is. So there, there's relief in knowledge. Let's get so that's the psychology behind it, right? Yes. And if you're, and I'm just as you were describing the psychological uh, reactions most people have to financial stuff. I was just wondering how many of them actually are feeling anxiety and have stopped listening. Oh, they've listening. already been triggered. Exactly I know. right. I know. But I so should have warned them. I'll, I'll tell you guys, the, <laughs> the system that we put in place forever when we prescribe to all of our coaching clients is really quite simple. We mentioned this before, and we're not sponsored by Intuit, but use mint.com, and it does give you, it's a free widget. It gives you, it's like a KPI dashboard of all your finances. KPI is key performance indicators. Right. It's great. And then patch in every, every account that everything, everything. And it gives you your credit score, all three real credit scores, not these fake credit scores that people get, but your real credit score from Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. It, like you, daily it does this. Uh, actually, I think it only Maybe updates it's monthly. Yeah. I don't know. Monthly. But it, it is up to date. And the, the thing is, don't do like half of it. Don't do like your part of it. You've got to do your entire financial picture. Otherwise, it really isn't that valuable. But what we're doing, we're helping you guys to do. And uh, again, this goes back to another conversation I had the other day, is you have to assume that when it comes to money, you are the world's biggest dumbass. And you have to assume that you're not going to stop being a dumbass. You have to assume that your natural inclination when you have money is going to be lose the money, spend the money. You're going to have yes. to assume that you're never going to change the way that you think about money. You're never going to be the squirrel that's storing nuts for the next winter. You're always going to be the squirrel that's it's going human to nature. You're always going to be the squirrel that's going to go to Vegas and want to, you know, basically <laughs> treat all of his friends flying out in the squirrel private jet. You guys getting my point? Mm -hmm. Do not assume that somehow you're going to overcome your nature to not save. Thus, you put system, or actually, it would be thusly, you put system in, systems in place yes. to force you to do it. And those systems would be, for example, obviously starting with Mint and then doing forced savings. And we talk about this in our book, Harris Rules. We talk about this on the podcast. Julian and I are big advocates of index funds research. Go and Google um, Bogle, uh, let's see, Bogle Heads, Heads, three fund portfolio. I know it sounds wackadoodle, but just do it yourself. Bogle, it's Bogle Heads. Uh, oh, I'm going to try to spell it. Correct me, right? B O G E L heads. It might be L E, but I'd have to look it up. Yep. Uh, dot org, and then research, or you can just drop into uh, Google or your, uh, you know, a different search engine because we're going to do a podcast on uh, Google soon. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and then figure out what um, you the know the, funds the three fund portfolio or the five fund portfolio, and you'll realize then what you should stop doing is thinking you can be a stock picker and you just index funds, uh, invest into like the S and P five hundred, and chances are you're going to be vastly better off than if you tried to figure it out yourself. Yes. Also, if you're an EXP agent, you can set it up to automatically save for you every single month, which well, is really yes, awesome. Well, yes, by buying EXPI stock. Yeah, I mean, that's another system, for well, example. The, so let's just talk about that since you brought it up. Mm -hmm. Buying individual shares for most of these people listing of any uh, equity is we not a smart speculate. move. Right. It's too it because it's, it's too much risk. Mm -hmm. What all of you should be doing until you're really, really wealthy is to, um, you know, buy index funds. And even frankly, after you're really, really wealthy, you should probably just still buy index funds because you cannot, first of all, it, you can't trust your, uh, it, it just is too much to risk. 
and you have to realize that it's going against what is your permanently coded uh, long-term operating system yes. with regards to money. Don't trust it. And that's, you know, buy rental properties. But when you buy a rental property, put that rental property in an LLC, put that LLC in a trust and make it so you cannot uh, even remotely access the equity in that uh, rental Don't property. Don't touch your stuff. Because you will spend it. You yep. will be, uh, yep, yep, I need, yep. you only live once. You, you, I'm dead a real long time. I might as well go and buy 14 Corvettes for all my friends. And that's what especially agents do. So again, put systems in place with regards to your finances. Put systems in place with regards to your household. With, you know, how you're going to basically, uh, you know, children, raising children, having rules about that. You know, I'm, as you guys can imagine, I would imagine you will not find this surprising. I'm much more traditional and I would say much more uh, Texan. <laughs> and, yes. And, and the par Probably. parenting of our often savage child, Zoe. <laughs> the savage. Uh, but between the two yeah. of us, we have certain elements that we've agreed to, even though how we've gone about doing things aren't necessarily the same. Julie is a lot more like if Zoe misses her bedtime, you know, by a little bit, not a big deal. And I know it's no big deal, but I'm trying to instill in this little the human discipline. disciplines yes. and understanding that there's ramifications to staying up too late on a school night. You're going to be tired and grouchy the next day. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to help her understand this. But between the two of us, we're getting it right. Um, and this thing but that, we do talk about this stuff to our, you know, yesterday's ending point, communicate about everything. We, we do talk about that, and we have basically not exact strategies, but similar strategies yeah, yeah. with regards to that. Well, um, a religion, right? Mm -hmm. When um, Zoe started going to school, we lived mm -hmm. in Texas. Yep. Um, my mom, who lives with us, or we frankly feel like we're living with her, mm -hmm. she uh, here in Puerto Rico, uh, she is a Catholic, mm -hmm. and we wanted Zoe to have a really good foundational, you know, the values that come from yes. uh, essentially having a religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. And that Catholic school she went to, I have to say, even though she only went to it for four years. When she was four three, and five years old. Yeah. yeah. That has had such an amazing, profound Huge. effect. Huge. Because now when she's around little kids that are on a higher heathen scale than her, and I say that lovingly, I'm trying to make you guys with kids right. laugh because you know what I'm talking about. Um, she will actually come up to us and she will actually say this kid's acting, you know, crazy. And then she'll sometimes even cite to us little Bible verses and things mm -hmm. why she knows that that is not how a, a, a girl or a little boy is supposed to right. act. And I'm, I'm proud of her ability to communicate that. And also, you, you know, your mom, just since we were talking about media before and this is all related, your mom's doing a good job um, keeping that going. Yep. Especially there, there is a series for kids called Veggie Tales, as in vegetables where they're little, you know, mm -hmm. talking vegetables or whatever. Uh, but that is, uh, you can, I think it's on a podcast, but that has like digestible uh, traditional values and things that kids can understand. Were you triggered when Julie them. said traditional? I know. That's your, That's something in your head. You got to root that out. Were you triggered because we're talking about religion? Here's what I almost actually said Christian values, well, but, but I made it traditional. Well, but it's, here's what this re religion truly is. Religion is a, uh, gives you a, uh, guidelines. Guidelines, right. I had a very nice long conversation with a friend of ours uh, when we lived in California um, at the uh, Long Beach Grand Prix, right? Jeremy McChesney. Mm -hmm. And he and I, he's a Mormon. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about Mormonism and, you know, we we're talking about Christianity. We we're talking about religion in general. And he really was very, very studied on all different types of religion. And it was a very fun conversation, mm -hmm. frankly. Matter of fact, I don't even remember anything about the damn race. But one <laughs> of the, yeah. at the end of the day, he said something which was very, very true. Mm -hmm. He said, what religion gives you is it gives you a, a set of guidelines in which to live your life. And generally speaking, if you follow those guidelines, your life's going to turn out pretty damn good. Yes, that's all and, it is. And that's it. That's it's it. Very right? simple. The simple rules of the road in which to govern yourself and how you coexist with other humans. And when you follow those rules, then all of a sudden, magically on the other side of it, chances are you're going to have a good outcome. Yeah. Well, it's your decision-making software that's baked into you eventually. And it, it helps you have some guidelines for living your life. And why not? What's wrong with that? That's true with any religion. And all religions yes. are based on... A, what are a specific a, set of beliefs that are supposed to lead you into a good life. Right. And, and you can call those traditional values. You can call those Christian values. But guess what? Jewish people have a lot of the same values with basically how they conduct themselves. So do Hindus. So do Buddhists. So do Muslims. They're all based. All of it's essentially a set of rules in which you essentially live your life by. That's what religion truly is. It yes. gives and you some the sense found, of discipline. Too. It, it makes it so everyone in the family is essentially reading from the same script. Indeed. And it gives you a place where you can go to when you're trying to resolve some 
external conflict or when some, you know, something is entered into the relationship or the family, you can lean back into those values and that gives you a rule book to flip through. Okay, Julie, look, on page 14, yeah. right, it says right here, this is what, you know, this is the rules that we should be following. And then you can discuss and modify accordingly. Yeah, but it also causes you, if you, if you marry someone who has similar beliefs, at least 90%, you also don't have to keep going back and say, well, what do you believe about that? What do you believe about that? I know that we have similar beliefs about some very specific things and that we would make the same, if not exactly the same decisions on those specific things. That's the it reason, just makes everything easier. That's the reason you said uh, a couple shows ago that oftentimes people that say are, for example, Catholic and uh, Jewish will mess. Will yes. Mess, okay. And, it's be, and it wasn't because of the differing religions. It was because of the commonality exactly. of the foundational beliefs that's that right. are formable in the religions. Very similar. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Again, this is, again, the series of this podcast. I think we sort of talked about real estate is how to have a <laughs> successful, happy marriage and partnership. And I know some of you guys are enjoying it. Um, those of you who aren't uh, enjoying it and you're looking for uh, real estate drill down, you know, how to make money, generate leads and all the rest of it. Well, we have literally thousands of other podcasts that are waiting for you to listen to on every single podcast yes. listing widget that there is out there. You thousands can e to come too. You can go to any of your search engines and you can put Tim and Julie Harris podcast and it'll pop right up. It's no problem. You don't even have to know the name of it. Um, but yeah, guys, so thanks for continuing to make this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And thank you for supporting us as we've perhaps gotten a little bit ahead of our skis and talking about mm -hmm. these types of topics. If you want more of this, frankly, we'd love to talk more about stuff like this because it's more interesting. You know, I look, we'll talk about the real estate stuff until the cows come home. But the reality of <laughs> it is, is it does sometimes get a little repetitious. It does. And it's all good stuff. It's all great, um, you know, practical, tactical things for you. But sometimes we have to do a podcast like this because it's not just about doing your deals. It's about living your life as well. And those things come together every single day for you. We know that because you know what? We used to actually walk in your shoes. So two days till Valentine's Day. Is yep. that right? 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Two days till Valentine's Day, including today. It's three days. Make sure you get your loved ones something special. And uh, yeah, and the last of the series will be on Valentine's Day. On Monday. On Monday. You guys have a fantastic weekend. And if you need us for anything, if you guys are ready to join EXP Realty and you're looking for a proactive sponsor, please do consider Julie and I. We are formally applying for the job of being your EXP sponsor. Text me directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. And again, thank you sincerely for keeping this the number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Have a fantastic day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs> <laughs>